Senators, before we go to questions, yesterday I ruled on a point of order regarding the use of the term dishonestly in an answer to a question in this context that referred to another senator. I ruled that the term dishonest has not previously been considered unparliamentary, but that I would look into the matter and report back. First, the term dishonest is not unparliamentary and therefore may be used. However, the context of all language needs to be considered, particularly with respect to Standing Order 1933, which prohibits, amongst other things, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections upon other senators. The relevant precedent on this terminology is mixed and unclear. On occasions, senators have been asked to withdraw it, and on other occasions, they have not. So to provide guidance to the chamber, I will, provide the, I will apply the following principles consistent with the use of other contentious terms. If the word dishonest is used collectively, for example, about a political party, it will not generally be out of order. If it is used specifically with respect to a senator, imputing that the person is dishonest, it will be out of order. It may be used to observe behaviour, for example, it is dishonest to claim, but it should not be attributed in a personal sense, for example, Senator XYZ is being dishonest. I accept this will lead to some grey areas, but in almost all circumstances, it can be used appropriately in an observational sense rather than a personal one. Given I have reviewed my ruling on this matter, I'm going to ask Senator Colbeck to withdraw the imputation yesterday. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw. I thank Senator Colbeck. Order, Senator Watt. Um, I thank Senator Colbeck and I thank the Senate. Senator O'Neill. Can I thank you for um, preserving my integrity and for the clarity of your ruling, President? Thank you. I remind senators that standing orders are the outer limit of what is in debate. They're not necessarily a guide to how far to push it. Um, and that applies to all of us. All of us, I should say, no one in particular. Uh, questions without notice, Senator Wong, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Yesterday, we saw reports of hundreds of former Australian embassy guards and their families left standing in sewage for hours outside of Kabul airport. Glenn Kolomets, a former ADF officer, now lawyer, has said Afghans attempting to flee Kabul who have been issued Australian electronic visas are, and I quote, being turned away by ADF people because they don't have a hard copy visa in their passports. Are reports that Afghans with Australian visas are being turned away at the airport by Australian officials true? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. Uh, while I can't speak to every incident that is happening uh, at Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, uh, given the very challenging and difficult circumstances that many people uh, across many nations are operating under there, uh, I can assure uh, that in terms of people who make contact with Australian officials uh, and have proof of contact, uh, proof of uh, some engagement with Australia, that every effort is being made to not only process them in terms of boarding, to recognise visas that may have been issued, but also to ensure that those who may not have a valid visa are supported through the processes on the spot with emergency contacts being made to seek to provide them with such visas. And now, of course, the security situation around Ahmed Karzai International Airport in Kabul is an incredibly challenging one. There are multiple checkpoints uh, that are being enforced by the Taliban. Uh, there are then, of course, clearances to access the airport perimeter itself. Uh, and were there to be instances at any of those, they may not be ones that are entirely known to all of us. But I do ensure the Senate and all Australians uh, that Australian officials on the ground are turning around visa applications, uh, visa requests, or even just those without an application as quickly as they can to get them out of Kabul and to safety. And that indeed is what's got us into a situation now where we've seen Australia help to airlift more than 2,600 people on 22 flights out of Afghanistan. The vast majority of those uh, being uh, Afghan citizens who we're supporting with visa, but of course also importantly Australian citizens, Australian permanent residents and the family members uh, of those uh, individuals. Uh, that's the work that our people on the ground are doing it. They're doing it uh, heroically, can I say, in the most trying of circumstances. Order. And we offer Senator a huge debt of gratitude. Time for the answers expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. 
When asked why the ADF were turning people away, Mr Kolometz replied, and I quote, these directions have come from DFAT. Who knows where in DFAT? There's a breakdown in communications here, not between ADF and DFAT, but between DFAT and DFAT, and that is going to cost lives. Have these directions come from DFAT? If yes, who issued the directive and why? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, as I said in response to the primary question, uh, our officials on the ground, DFAT officials working alongside Home Affairs officials who issue and process uh, the visas, uh, are not only doing their utmost to ensure that anybody who has any type of Australian visa is able to be able to board and depart Kabul, but they are also responding very clearly uh, to other individuals who have connections to Australia, reasons to want to seek claim, and working as quickly as they can to find appropriate humanitarian visas that can be issued in emergency circumstances uh, to be able uh, to expedite those people's departure from Kabul. Uh, we've indeed seen 950 people uplifted order. overnight. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President, direct relevance. It was a very specific question. Have the directions come from DFAT? And if so, who, if yes, who issued them and why? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You reminded him of it. Um, I'm uh, reluctant to rule the material he's dealing with as not directly relevant, but I've let you remind him of it, and he has 15 seconds remaining to turn to that part of the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I'm not uh, not accepting the assertion that there are directions that are turning people away. In fact. I'm making very clear that every effort is being made to accommodate people in their unique circumstances and to try to help them from Kabul as Order. expeditiously as Senator possible. Birmingham. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. How many Australian citizens, residents and visa holders remain stranded in Afghanistan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, we know that people continue indeed to uh, registered. That may seem a surprising thing that individuals uh, would not have made it known their presence in Afghanistan long before uh, the last little while, but registration is something that we have seen continue during this evacuation process. Uh, what we are doing, uh, Mr President, is working to move through those we can help as quickly as possible. Uh, that means helping all of those that we can who can make it through to Hamid Karzai Airport, to working with the officials from the many nations, particularly the United States, who are helping with security operations, including targeted assistance outside the airport perimeter, making sure that as a nation uh, we are lending assistance to others as we hope for them to lend assistance to us. 2,650 people in 22 flights uh, stood up at such short notice is no mean feat, Mr President. We extend all our thanks and gratitude to the officials and the Order. personnel. Senator Birmingham. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on the progress of Australia's evacuation operation in Afghanistan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson uh, for the question. Mr. President, the government's immediate focus is the evacuation of Australians and their families and Afghans with Australian visas uh, from Kabul. The scenes that we continue to see uh, in Afghanistan are dis uh, highly distressing, and our thoughts are with the Afghan people. Mr President, the National Security, National Security Committee of Cabinet continues uh, to meet every day on this matter. Our officials are working tirelessly on the evacuation, as uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate has uh, indicated, which is uh, moving hundreds of people from Afghanistan every day. I want to thank those senators and members and advocates who are doing the same thing to support so many people in Afghanistan. In recent days, uh, we have uh, been able to run about four flights per 24-hour period. Last night, five Australian ADF flights carried approximately 955 people, which brings uh, to approximately 2,650 the total number of people evacuated since the 18th of August, including Australian and New Zealand nationals, uh, visa holders and citizens of other nations with whom we are cooperating. The government reiterates our thanks to the officials involved, including from my Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Australian Defence Force, the Department of Home Affairs. Each person evacuated 
is a demonstration of their dedication. There are very difficult scenes outside Hamid Karzai International Airport. People, including women and children, are waiting for days amongst crowds numbering in the thousands. Our officials are using every means possible to assist Australian citizens and visa holders, phoning and emailing directly, as well as providing regular updates on Smart Traveller. Australia continues to work with partners across all aspects of the operation, and we thank them for their cooperation. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the role of the Al Minhad Air Base in this evacuation? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Australia's long-standing presence at Al Minhad Air Base in the United Arab Emirates has served as a vital support for our military presence in Afghanistan, and it is now serving a vital role in evacuating Australians and Afghan visa holders. I want to acknowledge and thank the government of the United Arab Emirates for their support and cooperation of this uh, evacuation process. The ADF has, has deployed more than 250 personnel and five aircraft to Al Minhad to carry out the evacuation operation. We have put significant plans in place for the health and welfare of evacuees, including the deployment of an OSMAT team, which is due to arrive today. We are very conscious, Mr President, of the traumatic experience, the fear and desperation of many who are travelling to our facilities at Al Minhad. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress of operations to return evacuees to Australia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, Mr President, I thank Senator Patterson again for this question. Uh, Al Minhad's capacity has been expanded to accommodate these evacuees ahead of their transfer to Australia. Once the evacuees have been settled uh, and processed for immigration uh, requirements and are ready to continue their travel, they are travelling on planes chartered by Defence to Australia. I do want to thank the states and territories that are contributing to Australia's response by receiving evacuees. Last night, 148 evacuees arrived on a charter flight to Perth and Adelaide, bringing the total number returned to Australia since the 18th of August to 419. Over the coming days, we will have regular flights into capitals around the country as these Australians and Afghans with Australian visas arrive. Our thoughts are with them as they deal with the trauma of these experiences, and we warmly welcome them to our nation. Yeah. Senator Pratt. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. WA Premier Mark McGowan, whose state has no local restrictions, criticised the Prime Minister for implying, and I quote, Western Australians were like cave people. Why did Mr Morrison liken Western Australians to cave people? Order. order. On my order, I, before I call Senator Birmingham, I am going to insist on order during the question. I'm going to insist on silence during the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I completely reject Senator Pratt's Order. assertion in there. Uh, it is completely false, uh, and indeed, uh, the attempt to beat these statements up, statements that were in no way suggesting that any particular part of Australia uh, were, as Senator Pratt has suggested. You know, this was an analogy drawn about the very important pathway out of the challenging situation Australia and indeed the world faces. And our plan, our plan is one focused very much on driving vaccination across Australia to support Australians as we hit 70%, 80% targets informed by the experts at the Doherty Institute to be able to move beyond widespread statewide lockdowns and restrictions, to be able to move beyond the restrictions that prohibit individuals from being able to reunite with families, with loved ones, or pursue business opportunities across state borders. We want to see success for Australia as we have succeeded compared to so many other nations in saving lives relative to so many others. We want to see success on the way out of this as well. And, and of course, what we have at the Labor Party is no plan. No plan, no pathway. Now, all we have are these sort of cheap political points that we're getting, whilst the rest of the country is getting on with striving Order. towards the plan. In stark Senator contrast Watt. to the Labor Party, Australians are turning out Order. in record numbers, day Order. in, day Order. out, getting vaccinated, 
driving us toward the targets that we need as a nation. That's what's going to get us Senator there, O'Sullivan, not the type of Senator point Watt. scoring from Senator Pratt or whatever it is that Senator Watt, who I can't hear from here, is saying, frankly, all of them, Mr President, or to think about the national interest. It's a blessing that I can't hear him. All might to think, all should think about no the problem, national Senator interest Watt. being served by driving the vaccine targets to a point where we can actually give Australian certainty and hope for the Order, future. Senator Berman, can I ask senators again across the chamber to restrain themselves when people are answering questions, particularly remotely, because I was having trouble hearing Senator Birmingham. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. The Morrison Joyce government has spent more than $1 million of taxpayers' money in support of Clive Palmer's High Court challenge of WA's border restrictions. Order. Isn't Mr Order. Morrison? Order. Both sides of the chamber there. Senator. Pratt, continue, please. Isn't Mr Morrison's likening of Western Australians to cave people just the latest in a series of attempts to undermine Western Australia? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, no, it's not. But Senator Pratt's desire to create division across Australia is absolutely a way of trying to hurt the nation. It's a way Order. of trying to hurt and divide. It's a way that will not help Western Australia or any other part of Australia move Senator through the White. remaining stages of COVID-19 to a better place once we see those vaccination targets hit, which day by day we get closer to thanks to the record numbers of Australians being vaccinated. More than 307,000 people who turned out yesterday across the country to have another vaccination dose or to have their first dose. Climbing our numbers, as we've seen with our senior Australians, now more than 85% of whom over the age of 70 have had that first dose and so many of them having had the second. They're setting the example, a positive example, that we want West Australians, South Australians, Victorians, Queenslanders, Tasmanians, New South Welshmen, the Territorians, all to be able to have the opportunity to be able to reach those targets Order. and know Senator in doing Birmingham, so. Senator Birmingham, the time for the answer has knowledge. expired. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. If Mr Morrison had acted like the vaccine rollout was a race and secured enough supplies, isn't it true Western Australia wouldn't need to have such tough border restrictions? And why is Mr Morrison more interested in insulting Western Order. Australians than taking responsibility Order. for his failures in the vaccine rollout. Order. Again, on both sides of the chamber then, there were interjections during the question. Senator Birmingham. Well, Senator Pratt showing absolutely no sense or logic of recognising what is happening right around the world at present. Now, Australia has been dealing for more than 18 months, as every other country has, with a global pandemic, a once in a century pandemic. As a nation, we've saved lives far more effectively than most others. And I pay tribute and acknowledge the West Australian government, as indeed all of our state and territory counterparts, working with us in ways that have helped to save those lives. Order. But indeed, it's a challenge with large global. You need only look at countries like Japan, countries like South Korea, places like Taiwan, or indeed a nation like New Zealand at present, to see these are difficult challenges with the Delta variant. And what each of us have in common is we've all managed to suppress the, the uh, suppress COVID-19 to a fair degree. We've all managed to suppress it in ways that have saved lives. But as a result, we didn't get the prioritisation that Europe or the US did in terms of some of the vaccines that were available. But we are all working hard well, uh, in terms Senator of Senator Birmingham, to I'm going to, to get out. Time has expired. I'm going to ask the indulgence of a senator. It was done in the House yesterday. The parliamentary photographer's here. If we all just want to let him take a shot of this somewhat unique parliamentary arrangement. This was done in the House yesterday, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop the clock on question time for that matter, Senator oppos of opposition senators. Sorry, I, didn't, I thought he had the camera set up. My apologies. Thank you. It's appropriate the Senate gets recorded as well not just the House. Um, Senator Seward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Today, the WA Australian Medical Association President Mark Duncan Smith said, "Going with 70, 80 per cent of only eligible adults is neglecting our children and bordering on child abuse." Through you, Mr President, Minister, do you agree that opening up restrictions when only 80 per cent of the adult population is vaccinated borders on child abuse? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, uh, no, I don't, Mr President. And I have to say it's really disappointing that uh, Senator Seawirt comes in here um, and uses parliamentary privilege in the sense to make those sorts of accusations. And quite frankly, it's outrageous, Mr President, that a member of the health profession in Western Australia would actually express those sorts of views um, uh, himself. Uh, purely and simply, Mr President, a cheap opportunity to Senator score Pratt, some political points. Mr President, the Doherty modelling, Mr. Mr President, the Doherty modelling, as I said yesterday. Senator Pratt. Mr. President, the Doherty modelling does contemplate the vaccination of children, albeit at a later date, Mr. President, albeit at a later date, in accordance, Senator Keneally, with the health advice. In accordance with the health advice, you, you, can, you can be as pious as you like about this, but we are operating in this country, Mr. President, uh, under health advice. Our vaccination program. Our vaccination program in this country, Mr. President, has been based on the advice and the approval, the full approval of vaccines through the TGA. Where in the US, they only this week had a full approval for their vaccinations, Mr. President. We made sure, Mr. President, we made sure in this country that there was confidence from the Australian community in the vaccination rollout and the vaccines that we were using by undertaking a full vaccination program through the TGA and providing advice to the Australian community through ATAGI, Mr President. So for the Greens to come in here with a quote from a GP or a specialist in, in Western Australia, Mr President, in an attempt to make cheap political points uh, to undermine the public confidence in the, the vaccination rollout, Mr President, I think is an absolute disgrace. Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Yes, I certainly do. Do you admit that if we loosen restrictions when only effectively 56 per cent of our total population are vaccinated, there is going to be a death rate in our children that, in fact, no parent will accept? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, again, the alarmist language of the Greens in respect of this is completely outrageous, Mr. President. Completely and utterly outrageous, Mr. President. Well, Mr. Order. President, I've got I would, Senator, Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. I've, I've got Senator Colbeck. I've got Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My point of order is on Miss. Uh, is on misleading the chamber. That's not a point of and order, Senator. No. So, Senator the, this Young, was a Senator comment Hanson made by Young, the President of the AM. Please resume your seat. Please, please resume your seat, Senator Hanson Young. There's the opportunity to debate the answers after question time. That is not a point of order for the chair to rule upon. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I would regard the comments of the President of the AMA to take the point of order in AMA in Western Australia as irresponsible and attempting to frighten parents with respect to the impacts of COVID-19 on children is quite frankly outrageous. Mr President, there's no question that there are risks to children from COVID-19, but let, let's look at the statistics. Let's look at the statistics, uh, and, and I have to say I think it's outrageous that they're trying to undermine the work of the Doherty Institute and all of the other institutions that have participated in this. But the, de but the, ICU, the hospitalisation rate for children, Mr President, is about 2 per cent. For those over the age Order, of 70, it's Senator 40 Colbert, to 70 per cent. There the is a big difference. Has expired. In Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question? I'll ask the same question that I asked yesterday. When will this government include children in the national vaccination targets and acknowledge that they have to be in there? Senator Colbeck. I think he was just giving me some relevant Mr President, 
The vaccination of children is clearly a part of the national vaccination program. We continue to operate the vaccination rollout based on the health advice. The, ad the Otagi advice with respect to vaccination of children is expected to be available for National Cabinet this week, Mr President. This week. The Doherty Institute has said that the 70 and 80 per cent numbers don't change. With, 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 with respect to the vaccination of children, including, the, including of, the ch of children in the targets, Mr. President, the National Cabinet, National Cabinet, not the Liberal Party, not the Labor Party, not the Greens, has commissioned the Doherty Institute to do this work. Liberal governments, order. Labor governments Senator across Hansen the country. Senator Hanson-Young, on a point of order, Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, on relevance, he still hasn't answered the question. It was about the targets, and we've only got five seconds Senator to Hansen go. Young, Could he get I to the Senator point? Senator Hanson Young, with respect, Sen Senator Colbeck was directly addressing the question. I can't direct him how to answer a question, but he was talking about the matters raised in the question um, to my way of hearing in some detail. Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? Senator Colbeck, Thank continue. you, Mr. President. The, the government will continue to operate on the professional and health advice in supporting Australians Order, receiving Senator vaccinations. Senator Colbeck. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government is assisting those who care for our most vulnerable to be vaccinated as part of delivering the national plan agreed by National Cabinet? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And thank you to Senator Scar for his question. Mr President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccination rollout continues to expand. To date, more than 17.7 million Australians uh, doses have been administered to Australians across the country. I'm pleased to report that first dose vaccinations for our residential care workforce who are looking after our most vulnerable uh, is at 76 per cent today. And I want to thank, Mr President, I want to thank all those carers, nurses, in fact all those who work in aged care for turning out to get a vaccine. Uh, and I'd urge those that haven't had their vaccine yet to take up that opportunity by the 17th of September. The Department of Health, Mr President, has been working with each residential aged care facility to ensure plans are in place to provide support where needed to ensure every residential aged care worker has access to a vaccine prior to the 17th of September. National Cabinet, Mr President, agreed that the COVID-19 vaccination of residential aged care workers will become mandatory by this date. That is when residential aged care workers must have received at least one first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. We encourage aged care providers to keep supporting their workforce. There are a number of channels open to support them to do that, including the government's inreach services, vaccinating their own staff and using Commonwealth and state vaccination clinics, also GPs and pharmacies. Mr President, all states and territories have agreed to use their public health orders to enforce vaccination for workers. Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania, ACT and the Northern Ter Territory have all implemented public health orders based on that advice. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. When can we expect to see children vaccinated in Australia as part of the vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. From August the 9th, around 220,000 children aged between 12 and 15 years old who are at higher risk of severe illness if they contract COVID-19 have been able to receive a Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Includes children with specified medical conditions, including severe asthma, diabetes, obesity, cardiac and circulatory congenital anomalies, and other serious conditions. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, children aged 12 to 15 years in remote communities as part of a broader community outreach vaccination program. And from the 25th of August, 40,000 NDIS participants aged between 12 and 15 years will all be eligible for vaccination. The Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation will provide further advice on the use of Pfizer vaccine for the remainder of children aged 12 to 15 very soon. 
Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Yes. Thank you, Mr President. What are the targets in the national plan for returning to a more normal life without lockdowns? And why is it so important for all governments, all governments, to work together in delivering the national plan? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As the Prime Minister has said, the national plan that we've developed and agreed is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal, to live with this virus, not to live in fear of it. When we reach vaccination levels of 70 and 80 per cent, we can look at easing restrictions, lockdowns and reopening borders, first state borders and, in time, international borders, Mr President. The national plan is our deal with all Australians. The sacrifices they make now will get them to the next step, because if not at 70 per cent and 80 per cent, then when? When? We should not delay reopening. We should prepare for it and we should move forward together. There is a plan out and, Mr President, we are moving forward with that plan. Order. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Over three months ago, the USA had already administered around 600,000 COVID-19 vaccinations to children aged 12 to 15 and more than 4 million to those aged under 17. Why are children still not broadly eligible for vaccination against COVID-19 in Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, as I've said a number of times in this chamber, the Australian government is conducting the vaccine rollout based on the health advice to us from the TGA, Order. from the TGA, Mr. President, Order. and ATAGI, Mr. President. It is worth noting, it is worth noting, Mr. President, that the vaccines that we are using in this country have been the subject of full approval processes by the Therapeutic Goods Association, Mr. President, by the TGA. The US only got a full approval of their Pfizer vaccine or the use of Pfizer vaccine this week in the US, Mr President. So they have been operating under an emergency approval process, Mr President. And Mr President, and so we continue unapologetically, Mr President, to work in conjunction with the health advice to make sure that we retain a high level of confidence in the vaccines that we're rolling out and that we have the best available data to support the vaccination rollout that we're using across the country. We don't apologise for that, Mr President. And as I've indicated to the Chamber already, we've received and implemented advice for the vaccination of children with a certain number of health conditions. That process has commenced, Mr President, and we expect to receive very soon advice from ATAGI with the respect of the vaccination of other children uh, in the 12 to 15 year old age group, Mr President. So we unapolog unapologetically continue to work in conjunction with the health advice from our health professionals and experts. The registration processes through the TGA uh, and the advice from ATAGI in support of our vaccination rollout. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. According to the UK Office for National Statistics, 34,000 children under the age of 17 are suffering with long COVID. What advice has the Morrison-Joyce government received about the prevalence and impact of long COVID, including in relation to children and infants? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the advice that I have with respect to the utilisation of uh, COVID-19 vaccines on children in the UK is that, that the advice that they are working on currently sits very closely to the advice that we're operating from on, in respect of uh, children with specific health uh, deficiencies. Mr President, in respect of the specifics Senator of oh. Senator's oh. question, I don't have any particular research with me in relation to 
long COVID. Uh, I'm very happy to see what advice I can uh, receive from uh, my, my health department because I know that our officials, that our officials, Mr. President, are in very regular contact with similar organisations around the world so that they can understand the implications, A, of the, the virus on various cohorts within the population, but also what they're doing with respect to the vaccination rollout and how they're applying the vaccine to various parts of their community. So Order. we can better Senator uh, operate Colbeck, our I, systems. I, we had four seconds left, so I'll allow Senator McAllister to raise a point of order. Thanks, Mr President. It is relevant. I asked specifically around long COVID. I understand from the minister's, if I may, I understand from the minister's response that he is seeking to take it on notice. Well, May no, I again, have him confirm Sen that? No, Senator McAllister, I can't ask a minister whether I'll do that. I can only rule on whether the minister was being directly relevant. And he did cover that as well as other matters. So he was being directly relevant. I'm assuming he's concluded his answer, so I'll call you to ask a final supplementary question. How many children will remain unvaccinated, unprotected and at risk when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16 years? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, I don't accept the premise of the question because I don't accept that children will remain unprotected. Pro vaccinating, vaccinating the rest of the population does in itself provide a level of protection to the rest of the population that hasn't been vaccinated because it actually limits the transmission of the disease. That's the point of having the targets, Mr Order. President. That's the point of having the targets. So, Mr President, we will continue to follow the health advice with respect to the application of vaccines to the Australian community. And as I've said on a number of occasions today, the, the advice from ATAGI with respect to the availability of COVID-19 vaccinations to children uh, between 12 and the ages of 12 and 15 will be available to the government and to the Australian community very soon. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister please outline how our government is supporting regional Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic, including as part of the national plan agreed to by National Cabinet? Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. Our government understands regional Australians facing lockdowns are asking immediate questions about their incomes, about the weeks ahead and about the pathway back to a normal life where we learn to live with this virus. Rural and regional Australians are feeling the ongoing impact of the pandemic, particularly the Delta variant, which has forced two entire states into lockdown and seen localised lockdowns within states and border communities particularly are feeling uh, the, the effects. However, until we reach the recommended vaccination targets, lockdowns are the most effective way to stop the spread, and they will still be necessary. We're ensuring the financial security of those who live or work in a Commonwealth hotspot through the COVID disaster payment, and we've already delivered $4 billion in support to over 1.6 million Australians. Regional Australians, like others, are doing the right thing. They're pulling up their sleeves and they're getting vaccinated in record numbers. We've already seen 17 million doses delivered so far, 4.6 million of those uh, in regional Australia. We must back the science and the evidence that informs our national plan. Once we achieve our target of 70 to 80 per cent vaccinations, Australians will be able to get back to a sense of normality. Restrictions will safely be able to ease and lockdowns will become a thing of the past. But our government is particularly uh, committed to making that happen and providing Australians with the necessary support that we can learn to live with the virus, not fear it. We're assisting regional families with childcare, providing gap-free waivers to relieve the burden of out-of-pocket costs when their children cannot attend care. We're also extended telehealth and MBS items. Telehealth can't replace face-to-face 
uh, health services, but it is critical, particularly with the mental health impacts of lockdowns that we see now. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, we know regional businesses are suffering through the lockdowns as much as their urban counterparts, even where there has been no COVID. What is our government doing to help manage them through the impacts of the lockdowns and the border restrictions that are currently in place? Senator McKenzie. Our government has partnered with each of the state and territory governments to roll out business support packages tailored to their specific needs. In my home state of Victoria, we've combined with the Andrews government to deliver $1.46 million to around 18,000 regional business doing it tough during lockdown to help them with those ongoing uh, operational costs so that when lockdowns lift, uh, they can get back to business and employing people as quickly as possible. We're assisting local businesses such as childcare providers uh, with further support for the sector, which will benefit over 2,000 providers in regional Victoria and New South Wales. We've committed more than $4.9 billion to the aviation sector. Our primary producers are also supported, and we're addressing air freight shortages and disrupted supply chain for exports through, through the international freight assistant mechanisms. We've got the Ag Workforce Code. These measures are all vital to keep our primary industry sector growing, harvesting and feeding not only our nation but the Order, world. Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Yeah, finally, Minister, what other supports are available for regional Australians and the communities they live in, and why is this so important to our national plan? Senator McKenzie. Well, Mr President, the Liberal and Nationals government have stood ready to assist states and territories with additional support uh, through this pandemic. Most recently, we deployed support to regional New South Wales, where we've seen increasing case numbers. Around 50 ADF personnel are currently supporting New South Wales police in Dubbo, Burke and Wilcannia. An additional 70 ADF personnel are supporting Western New South Wales Health District to provide pop-up vaccination clinics in remote and regional communities such as Walgett, Canamble and Gilgandra. While this support is absolutely critical right now, it won't be required when we reach our vaccination targets outlined in the national plan. Our plan is based on the best available data and science and is agreed to by all state and territory governments as part of National Cabinet. I'm particularly buoyed by the support of the Labor Party uh, and Mr Albanese finally backing Bill and Joel in getting behind the national plan as the only way to end lockdowns and get back to normal. Order. Senator Waters remotely. Thanks, President. Uh, my question... My I'm sorry, question... Senator Waters. I'm going to ask you to start again because there's too many interjections in the chamber and I can't hear you. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. The US Ambassador to Australia said on global climate change negotiations last week, and I quote, it would be really helpful to see Australia move forward with a more ambitious effort. What the science is telling us is their pathway needs to be more aggressive, end quote. The US, the UK, the EU, Japan and South Korea have all lifted their 2030 pledges. Why is Australia turning its back on our allies and trading partners in these climate negotiations and instead siding with the petro-states of Russia and Saudi Arabia? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, absolutely reject the premise and the f facile assertion at the end of uh, Senator Waters' question, quite frankly. In fact, Australia is working very hard to deliver our long-term emissions reduction strategy. We will release that ahead of COP26, as we have made very clear. We'll release our updated forecasts ahead of COP26, which are expected to show a further improvement on Australia's 2030 position. We have a strong record of meeting and exceeding our international emissions reduction targets, including overachieving on both our first Kyoto emissions target and our 2020 target. Our latest data um, emissions are shown at 20 per cent below 2005 levels, Mr President. We believe in achieving, not just talking about it, but achieving. And those achievements are records to which we can point as a nation. Our emissions are lower than in any year under the previous government and at the lowest levels since 1990. 
We are strongly committed to playing our part in, in the global effort to combat climate change through the Paris uh, Agreement, as set out in all of the Pacific Island Forum's declarations, Mr. President, the Boy Declaration, the Kanaki Two Declarations, and we have been clear, as the Prime Minister has indicated, that we intend to reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. It's easy to make crap targets. Is the government's sorry, intention? Sorry, Senator Waters. I, sen I, I, I couldn't hear it, but I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said, crap. Senator Waters. Can I, can I ask you to start again? Yes, thank you, President. I was pointing out it's easy to make crap targets. Right, Senator Waters. That, Senator Waters, that's not helpful in question time. Please, the clock's running. Continue your question. Is it the government's intention to go into climate negotiations in Glasgow at the end of the year with Russia and Saudi Arabia as our only diplomatic allies, or is your department working on strategies to satisfy the United States and the rest of the developing world and the developed world by lifting our 2030 target? Senator Payne. Well said. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I think I outlined our next steps in terms of working to deliver on our long term emissions reduction strategy, our intentions to release that ahead of COP26, our intentions to release our updated forecasts ahead of COP26, which are, as I said, expected to show a further improvement on Australia's 2030 position. Our budget included over $630 million worth of additional investment to support low emissions technologies and partnerships. Partnerships that we are securing, Mr President, with a range of international partners, with Germany, with Singapore, the United Kingdom and with Japan. We share with the United States a resolute commitment to ambitious action on climate change. We want to be a partner of choice for the United States on climate and align our climate with broader objectives to strengthen economic integration and advance our shared interests in the Indo-Pacific. We're advancing practical targeted collaboration with the United States across the broad climate agenda, including low emissions technologies and supply chains. I've discussed this, my, this myself with Secretary Kerry, Order. how Senator Australia Payne, and the US can time create for practical the momentum. Has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. The British Foreign Secretary asked Australia in March to stretch our climate ambitions and to match what the science requires which is a doubling of our targets to keep within two degrees or a tripling of them to keep within one and a half degrees. Will you listen to our global allies or will you listen to the coal, oil and gas companies that are slowly turning Australia into an international pariah? Senator Payne. Well, Mr. President, once again, I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Waters' question, uh, which is not founded in reality by any stretch of the imagination. What we are focused on, Mr. President, is not just talking about targets, but actual achievements. And that would be the difference. That would be the record on which we are prepared to stand, Mr. President. We are resolutely committed to Paris. We know that we are on the front. Uh, line of climate change impacts. We've indicated, and I've said it again in here this afternoon, that we'll reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 10 2050. But that takes real investments in technology, Mr. President. Technology that reduces emissions and stimulates economic growth. I know economic growth is a comp complete pariah for the Greens, but it's not for us, it's not for our country, and it's not for the world. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The ACT Chief Minister and Chief Health Officer argued that people aged 12 years and above should be factored into the vaccination rate required for reopening. Given that 38 per cent of cases in the ACT are children under 17 and around 30 per cent of COVID-19 cases in New South Wales are people under 20, Will the Morrison-Joyce government consider this? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, if the ACT Chief Minister actually believed that, why did he agree to the Doherty modelling at National Cabinet, which was agreed by all of the Premiers, which includes vaccination and consideration of vaccination rates for proportions of the policy, uh, population, Mr President. Of course, vaccination for children is important, Mr President. It is more important, Mr President. But the, the ACT Chief Minister sat in National Cabinet, agreed to the targets in the Doherty modelling 
and if he wanted to change Order. it, why didn't he do it then instead of in a press conference, Mr. President? He could do it again on Friday when National Cabinet meets again, Mr. President. There will be further information on the Doherty modelling presented to National Cabinet on Friday. That's public information, Mr. President. So if the if the national if the if the if the, the chief minister of the ACT wanted to change the parameters of the modelling with respect to the vaccination rollout, why didn't he do it in national cabinet? Why does he do it publicly in a press conference or get Senator Keneally to ask a question in question time? He's sitting in one of the chairs that gets to make the decisions, Mr. President. Why doesn't he ask the questions there? Why doesn't he? propose the modification of the parameters at that point in time, Mr President. Why doesn't he do that? He is one of the few people that gets to sit in National Cabinet. He is one of the few people that gets to be a participant in those decisions. So why doesn't he use the forum that he has available to him to actually put those inputs into that process? Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. The New South Wales Chief Health Officer, Kerry Chant, has said in relation to vaccines, and I quote, I believe in, targ I believe in targeting school-aged children, in particular high school children, very quickly because we know that they contribute to transmission. The Pfizer vaccine has been approved for children as young as 12. If the Morrison government had ordered more Pfizer last year, would Australians aged 12 to 19 now be vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Keneally is right. The New South Wales CHO does actually believe in vaccination of children. and I have to say I congratulate uh, New South Wales on the work that they have done, particularly, Mr. President, particularly with respect to vaccination of uh, senior high school Order. students, so that they, it frees them up to sit their very important examinations towards the end of the year, Mr. President. So I, I congratulate the New South Wales government and the CHO on actually taking action to put in place Order. the convictions that they clearly have, Mr. President. Congratulations to them on doing that, Mr. President. Order. What, what this government has done, and we will continue to do, Mr. President, is to work collaboratively with the states, work collaboratively with the states, to deliver the national plan for the rollout Order. of the vaccine, Mr. President, to, to deliver the, the rollout of the vaccine uh, in accordance with the health advice. Uh, and of course, in accordance with the national plan for opening Order, up the Australian Senator economy. Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Is the reason children aged 12 and above are not included in the targets because Mr Morrison did not order enough Pfizer last year to vaccinate 12 to 15-year-olds? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, the reason uh, that they're not in the targets is we actually don't have an approved vaccine or a target advice to support that. To we, we, don't have, we don't have a target Order. advice yet to support that in the rollout of vaccine, Mr President. So, Mr President, the, the Labor Party come in here continuously putting false premises to the, to the parliament, but also trying to undermine public confidence in the vaccination rollout program. We continue, Mr President, as we've done all the way through, to act on the health advice. We don't yet have a target advice with respect to the vaccination of children between the ages of 12 and 15. We are expecting it very Senator, soon, Mr Senator, President. We Senator are expecting Watt. it very soon. In fact, we're expecting it to be able to go to National Cabinet this week, Mr President. Mr President, so, Senator Mr. Keneally. President uh, we will continue to follow the advice of the health professional, professionals who have very Order, well Senator guided Colbeck. us throughout Senator the role O'Sullivan. Of Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the national plan agreed by National Cabinet in bringing confidence to small and family businesses across Australia, and how the Liberal and National Government is supporting these businesses to get through and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And Mr President, 
The Morrison government well and truly believes and acknowledges that small and family business they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And since the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have provided to them and other businesses around Australia unprecedented economic and health support. And what we're now seeing is Australians will and truly step up and back small and family businesses around the country by backing and supporting our national framework for reopening. Australians themselves, and you can see this every single day, as Senator Colbeck tells us, they are putting their arms out and they are getting vaccinated. And we see that reflected in the vaccination rates every day. Because Australians understand that vaccination is the key to reopening and it is the key, as set out by National Cabinet, to ending the lockdowns and ensuring that our businesses across Australia, but in particular our small and family businesses, they again have the confidence that they need. And Mr President, the Morrison government, we continue to put in place those policies which will help our small and family businesses. And you will have seen today that we have announced that we are now providing additional support to small and medium businesses around Australia who continue to deal with the economic fallout and the economic impacts of COVID-19. And what we are doing is expanding eligibility for the Small and Medium Enterprise Recovery Loan Scheme. What we are doing now is we are removing the requirements for SMEs who have received JobKeeper during the March quarter in 2021 or to have been flood affected, um, a flood affected business in order to be eligible for this scheme. This is a good thing for those businesses, and what it shows is that we are continuing to put in place those policies that will back our businesses around Australia every step of the way. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the new eligibility for the SME Recovery Loan Scheme assist businesses that have been impacted by the lockdowns and restrictions that are currently in place? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. Well, SMEs who are dealing with the economic impacts of the coronavirus with a turnover of less than $250 million will now be able to access loans of up to $5 million over a term of up to 10 years. Other key features of the SME Recovery Loan Scheme include the government will guarantee 80 per cent of the loan amount. Lenders are allowed to offer borrowers a repayment holiday of up to 24 months. Loans can be used for a broad range of business purposes, including to support investment. If you can invest in yourself, we want to back you. Loans may be used to refinance any pre-existing debt of an eligible borrower, including those from the SME Guarantee Scheme. Loans can also be unsecured or secured. What again we're doing is the expanding scheme will enable lenders to continue supporting Australian businesses when we know they need it the most. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. How can each and every Australian, Australian business and employee, help ensure that the delivery of the national plan so Australia can chart its way out of this pandemic? Senator Cash. Mr President, that's exactly what we know Australians want to do. Chart our way out of this pandemic, and in particular, when it comes to those mum and dad small businesses around Australia, we all know that the best thing that we can do to support them at this time is to get vaccinated. Vaccinations, not lockdowns, are the answer to getting us out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we all know that by hitting the vaccination target, we'll be able to reopen and we all will be able to see that light at the end of the tunnel. Mr President, Small businesses, if we don't hit the vaccination Order. targets, they will close. Jobs will be lost. What we owe to every small business around Australia is to get behind the plan that has been agreed by National Cabinet. That is the plan to give them the confidence that they need, that they know that we're backing them every step of the way and that the country is backing them every step of the way. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services and the NDIS, Senator Reynolds. How many children with a disability in Australia have had their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine? The Minister for the NDIS and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, 
start again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the senator for her question. Uh, this is so. Can I just clarify? You're talking 12 to 15s. Sorry, sorry. sorry can you? Sorry, sorry. I'll just I missed um, some of the questions. Not question. really iterative, but I'll, I'll allow Senator Senator O'Neill to clarify the question. Yes. Okay. It's children Senator. with disability. So, Senator, including Senator Rennie. those 12. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I've Order. Thank you. Uh, in relation, first of all, to the uh, under 12s children with uh, with disability, uh, as the senator would know, that no country in the world yet has vaccinations for under 12s. Order. In relation to 12 or, 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 to 15, that, are you raising a point of order, Senator O'Neill? Point, point of order, just because there was a little lack of clarity. I'll ask the question again. It wasn't no, no, about Senator O'Neill. No, no, I'm sorry. I can't. I, 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 the minister asked you to clarify. The question was, look, Senator O'Neill, the question was how many children with disability have had a first dose of a vaccine? The minister is being directly relevant by answering the question in the form she is. Um, I can't instruct the how to. We're not long to the debate of answers after question time. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And that's why I sought the clarification, because obviously there are different cohorts of children's ages. However, if the senator is referring to 12 to 15, I can confirm that this week I confirmed uh, publicly that all participants 12 to 15, of which there are 48,308, uh, were now eligible for the Pfizer vaccination uh, nationwide. And since uh, that announcement that it opened yesterday, we have had over 1,056 participants in this cohort who have already received a vaccination. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Sydney mother, Heike Farbig, whose son Bodhi lives with multiple disabilities, including neuropathy, has said, and I quote, it took me eight attempts and eight dead ends before, by pure sheer coincidence, I found somewhere that would vaccinate my child. Why has the Morrison-Joyce government left it up to sheer luck for children with disabilities to be vaccinated? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, and can I just say that is one of the most ridiculously uh, dangerous questions to ask in this place, a bit reminiscent of the Greens question today. We have over 8,000 8, locations people can book, including several thousand in uh, New South Wales. So to give you an idea, we have been, since I've become minister, we have provided new Order. ways of getting people vaccinated. Um, as I've said yesterday, we announced that Pfizer vaccinations, and there are over 8,000 locations, including 2,500 in New South Wales, Order, Senator Watt. providing a safe access to vaccinations, not just for people with disability, but also their families and carers, Order. is a priority. So at the moment, we're vaccinating 1.8 million people each week, and we are also providing new ways. So since we started the new approach. 90,000 NDIS participants have been uh, vaccinated, and that rate is increasing exponentially uh, over the Reynolds, last few weeks. Time's the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. I'm sure the mothers are listening very carefully. Sydney mother Yolanda Cayley, whose 14-year-old daughter Zoe has Down syndrome, was forced in desperation to turn to Twitter to find a vaccine appointment. The risk of dying of COVID-19 for people with Down syndrome is 36 times higher than the general population. How many children with disabilities will remain unvaccinated, unprotected and at risk when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, uh, I can confirm that there are thousands of ways and locations for people to get vaccinated. I understand, I understand in New South Wales at the moment, given the number of cases and the number of vaccinations that are occurring, but there are two ways uh, she can also try, is through her local pharmacist and her local GP, who I know many of them are giving priorities Order. to parents and children and workers in the disability sector. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I ask that further questions be placed on notice. We now move to the attendance by a minister regarding the order for production of documents pursuant to the order of the 12th of August. Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And, uh, Mr. President, the government does not make public interest immunity claims lightly. We never have, and we never will. And we certainly don't do it without the careful consideration of the particular harm to public Order. interest. I have carefully Order. reviewed the claim. I have personally, again, carefully reviewed the claim of public interest immunity and recognise that it would not be in the public interest to disclose the information over which the claim is being reiterated in relation to legal advice and also to the deliberations of Cabinet. Now, now, Deputy President, the government has engaged in good faith with the Senate and its committees at all times. We have provided updates and additional explanations as litigation in relation to the income compliance program has progressed. Uh, in addition, Government agencies and witnesses have responded to many hundreds of questions at hearings and on notice in relation to the design and implementation of the income compliance program. So, Firstly, the claim of uh, disclosure of information relating to legal advice. It doesn't automatically follow from the federal court's approval of the class action settlement that there is no longer a proper basis for the government to maintain public interest immunity over the legal advice it received in connection with the income compliance program. The claim for information relating to legal advice has been made on two grounds. Firstly, the very, very long-held practice of claiming privilege over legal advice and associated documents obtained in the course of normal decision-making processes of government. The second ground is in, in relation to the possible prejudice to the Commonwealth in relation to the conduct of litigation relating to the income compliance program. The claim is grounded in the importance of government being able to obtain legal advice in relation to the normal decision-making functions without the risk of the advice or the information relating to that advice being disclosed. If such a risk existed, it could prevent governments from appropriately seeking and obtaining such legal advice. The availability of frank legal advice to decision makers within government should be and must be protected as a fundamental principle of good government. Although the class action settlement has been approved, as recognised by the Federal Court on the 11th of June 2021, not all potential claims arising from the Income Compliance Program will be resolved through the class action. Disclosing the content or dates of any legal advice would obviously have the very real potential of prejudicing the Commonwealth's ability to defend the claims. To this point, I note that the Federal Court has previously found that advices are the subject of this public interest immunity claim to be privileged legal advice. In fact, His Honour Justice Lee upheld the Commonwealth's claim of legal professional privilege in connection with every one of those documents, subject of the challenge from Gordon Legal. Deputy President, allow me to remind the Senate that former Labor, that former Labor Minister Joe Ludwig told Senate estimates that he would refuse to provide the Labor government's legal advice for the very same reason. And he said this, it has been long-standing practice of both this government and successive governments not to disclose the content of advice. Similarly, this practice has also been previously outlined by former Hawke Keating uh, government attorney general, the Honourable Gareth Evans QC, who said this in this very chamber in 1995. Nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over the years for any government to make available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of the normal decision-making process of government for good practical reasons associated with good government and also a matter of fundamental principle. Now, secondly, Deputy President, the, minister, the minute disclosed of deliber deliberations of Cabinet. So I will now turn to the uh, public interest immunity claims relation to Cabinet deliberations. Providing a copy of or information about the minute requested by the Senate Community Affairs References Committee would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of Cabinet. It is in the public interest for the deliberations of the Cabinet not to be made public. By making a public interest claim in respect of the minute, the government is doing no more than standing by a well-established right to protect the disclosure of cabinet deliberations in the same way that has been done by past successive governments. In interlocutory hearings in the class action, the federal court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to cabinet materials, including this minute. Further, 
As recently as the 4th of August 2021, the Freedom of Information Division of the AAT found that this document was properly the subject of Cabinet exemption under the Freedom of Information Act. So, in closing, the letter from me setting out a detailed explanation about the basis of public interest immunity claim has been provided to the Chair of the Community Affairs References Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Seward? I rise to take note of the Minister's uh, response to the resolution of this place and her, the comments that she has just uh, made in the chamber. Um, I reject the claim made by the government and the continued claim and then the basis on which the government, sorry, I will take this off, I apologise, the basis on which the government is claiming uh, public interest immunity. I'd put it that this is, they're actually claiming government interest immunity because this is about protecting the government and making sure that, or trying to make sure that the community does not get access to the information that the Community Affairs Committee has, I will note, repeatedly asked for. And I will remind uh, this place, as I did yesterday, and as in fact Senator um, Pratt was just commenting, the Senate has never, it has never been accepted by the Senate, nor in any other comparable representative assembly, that legal professional privilege provides grounds for a refusal of information in a parliamentary forum. What we have here is a system that took illegally or made people who'd received income support Ill illegally those debts were claimed and it made people pay $1.7 billion to the government. So on top of refunding the $1.7 billion to all those hundreds of thousands of people that were affected deeply by this scheme, they also, of course, had to pay 100 and I think it's 112 million to cover interests. That's not compensation. That's just pure up covering, uh, recovering, uh, paying back the debts. That, but nobody could ever, I would argue, fully repay and compensate the people that were affected by this scheme fully because it caused untold damage. So what this government is saying is that other people who weren't covered by the class action may in the future, may in the future, want to bring action against the government. And the government wants to protect itself against Australians who consider that their debt was also raised illegally. That's what the government's saying here. And the sorts of things that we were asking for I don't think is unreasonable. Legal advice. Did they get it? If they did, when did they get it? Who provided it? Did they seek? In fact, it, as I said, I don't think that these requests are unreasonable. Now, as we know, we have uh, this Senate inquiry is ongoing and we had a hearing on the 19th of August and we had Mr Gretsch from Gordon Legal, as again we mentioned yesterday, uh, present evidence to us. And he made a number of ob observations when I asked about uh, the case, the ongoing case and the issues around claims of uh, public interest immunity. Uh, Mr Gretsch went through a number of issues, but he also uh, on specifically around these issues and the claim that uh, the court found that upheld the government's claims of public interest and immunity. It's funny, it's not how I understand the evidence that Mr Gregg gave us yesterday, who said that some documents the judge agreed uh, were covered by public interest and immunity, but others not. He, he said in answers to questions um, from myself at this stage, having said that, I must say that one of the concerns we had throughout the conduct of the proceeding was what we considered to be the Commonwealth making quite spurious claims of legal professional privilege and parliamentary privilege in respect of documents. The record will show that there are very extensive court processes involved in persuading and at times it required judges to make orders to co coerce, 
can never say that word, um, the Commonwealth to abandon some of the claims it made. I think it is quite concerning. It is a quite concerning feature, increasingly, of the way the Commonwealth litigates disputes that it tends to claim both legal professional privilege and parliamentary privilege over a very, very wide array of documents. Um, he then goes on to say, amongst other things, that there is a deep concern that we have, and I know it has been expressed in academic circles as well, of how those privilege are being abused. He goes on. When he went on. When, the gov when governments abuse these privileges, it brings the whole system into disrepute and creates an enormous undermining of public confidence in the way our governments operate in and, in particular, in relationship between our public servants and the government. I argue very strongly that, and support, in fact, what Mr uh, Gretsch said during this inquiry. We expect the government to be model litigants. And Mr Gretsch elsewhere talked about the fact that that's what the uh, government should in fact be. Mm -hmm. And yet they are claiming, in this case, parliamentary privilege over a very, very wide array of documents. And he talked, I reiterate, it creates an enormous undermining of public confidence. Well, the government has already undermined confidence in it and the way it operates our social security system by the very fact that robo-debt happened in the first place. <coughs> it caused such distress and they further undermine confidence in governments by the fact that they now seek to hide it because that is what they are doing. Let's make no bones about it. They are seeking repeatedly to hide in very, very important details about this whole sorry saga. And unless we actually identify what went wrong, the Australian community has no guarantee that this sort of thing will not happen again. Sort of saying you're sorry, which is in fact sort of what happened with robo-debt, there was a sort of sorry, actually means and should mean that you mean it and that it won't happen again. And as I just said, we have no guarantee that this <laughs> won't happen again if the government doesn't come clean. And you, by seeking to perpetually claim public interest immunity, what you do is build further the case <coughs> for a Royal Commission on this issue. Because I can tell you, all the people that I get contacted by about robo-debt express complete lack of confidence in the government and the way they handled robo-debt and how upset they continue to feel that they were hounded, hounded with debt collectors at the door in some instances, not all instances, but in some instances debt collectors at the door, on the phone, feeling intimidated, feeling scared, feeling like they'd done something wrong. I had pensioners crying in the hearing, literally tears streaming down their throat, their face. They're, they're unable to speak because they were so choked up because, because they thought that the government and the community thought they had stolen money, thought they had cheated the Commonwealth and they had done no such thing. Now that causes deep psychological distress. We don't want to see that happen again in this country, but we are at risk of seeing that happen again if this government continues to hide behind the fact, uh, hide behind public interest immunity. And I am hoping that this place will continue to try and hold this government to account to get access to these, this information, information that the Australians affected by this deserve to know. I urge the government to reconsider and not just, with all due respect, cut and paste yet again their excuses for not presenting the information that the committee is after. We are after whether legal advice was sought, whether the advice was provided internally or externally, the dates when the legal advice was sought and provided. The minister 
has not articulated how the release of this information could possibly prejudice ongoing court proceedings. You just, just exactly, Senator O'Neill, you just claim it, you don't explain it. It's not good enough for our community. We expect better, particularly in the face of how outrageous this robo debt scheme was. Thank you, uh, Senator Seaver. I'm going to go to Senator Patrick on the screen. Thanks. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, I uh, wish to just follow up on some of the things that Senator Seaward said and uh, firstly make it very clear that if the government were to table legal advice in this chamber, then that advice is protected by parliamentary privilege and cannot be used in a court, just in the same way that uh, legal advice is otherwise protected through the normal doctrine of legal professional privilege. Now, I'm very glad that the attorney is sitting there because she will be aware of the case of Egan and Chadwick in the New South Wales Court of Appeal, where uh, three justices made a unanimous ruling that legal professional privilege does not, uh, is not an exemption uh, that can apply in relation to uh, a request by a House of Parliament. The court ruled that it is quite within the rights of a House of Parliament to gain access to the advice upon which governments made their decision. That's part of the oversight process. It's uh, disingenuous for the minister to walk in to the, into the uh, chamber and suggest that it's okay to do so because the court upheld legal professional privilege. The whole point of legal professional privilege is not to keep things uh, secret. It's to make sure that uh, discussions between lawyers and their clients cannot be used in a court. Cannot be used in a court. That's the only place that the protection applies. And so it's quite incorrect to uh, try and roll out that a justice may have upheld that claim uh, and use that as some reason for not uh, tabling something in this chamber. Uh, again, the relevant case is Egan, Egan and Chadwick, and I'm sick of ministers standing up and saying that uh, repeatedly attorney generals have said uh, something in this, uh, uh, in this chamber that suggests legal professional privilege uh, documents shouldn't be tabled, because it is wrong. It is wrong in law, and it's wrong for attorneys to make that sort of assertion. Now, I acknowledge that this assertion was made by Minister Reynolds and not the attorney, but the attorney must always uh, uh, seek to uphold the law uh, outside of the, the, this building, but also uh, inside and recognise uh, the, uh, the ju jurisdiction of, uh, you know, of, the, of the courts. Then in relation to claims that uh, somehow a uh, document shouldn't be tabled here because uh, it's, legally, uh, it's legally privileged and the AAT upheld it. Again, the AAT is a, an environment uh, in which the same rules don't apply in terms of uh, ability to, uh, to look at uh, uh, legal do legal privilege, legally privileged documents. Then I'll now move to Cabinet uh, claims. And I've got a bit of background on Cabinet, uh, having won a few uh, of these matters in the... In the uh, uh, information Commissioner and indeed in the AAT. Again, the Senate has never accepted uh, that just because something is a Cabinet document uh, that it can't be ordered for uh, production. Uh, that is not true of deliberations of Cabinet, but there has been a ruling uh, in our courts that the deliberations of Cabinet are the actual discussions that take place between cabinet ministers as recorded in the notebooks. Now, the notebooks uh, that, that are associated with cabinet are very special in that they, uh, even under the National Archives Act, have an additional 10 years over cabinet documents. Cabinet documents re are released after 20 years. Cabinet notebooks still are only released after 30 years, recognising that is the place in which deliberations are recorded. Uh, in the minutes of, uh, of Cabinet, uh, only 
a record of the decisions are made, which recommendations are accepted uh, uh, and what actions might need to be taken are, uh, are actually recorded. And it's long been accepted that in exceptional circumstances, and I will, uh, to, to make sure I'm not misleading the chamber, state that it has to be exceptional, uh, that either the courts or the Senate uh, cannot uh, seek access to cabinet documents. That ruling was made in Northern Land Council in the High Court, basically making very clear that if, in the, that if the interests of justice required it, then in fact cabinet documents could be uh, required to be produced in a court. The, uh, in relation to the, to the Senate, I encourage senators to go and have a look at a uh, lecture that was given by Brett Walker SC as part of the parliamentary series that also stated the same claim uh, as, uh, uh, as exists in the court that ultimately the Senate can seek these sorts of documents. Again, the, the burden is high. I don't uh, necessarily suggest that the burden in this instance uh, would warrant it in relation to the Cabinet documents, but a minister should not walk into this chamber and mislead by, by uh, su suggesting that uh, these documents can't be provided. They'd much, be much better off simply saying that the burden hasn't been met. Uh, we need to make sure that in the, inside this chamber, when we're dealing with matters of oversight, when we're exercising uh, the, the, our role uh, in relation to oversight of government, uh, that things are done properly and in accordance with the judgments of, of courts. Now, you might think that the courts don't have application or don't have jurisdiction to examine uh, whether or not the Senate does or doesn't have a power. Uh, that was found in the case of Egan and Willis that the court can uh, can make a determination as to whether or not the Senate has a particular power. It just can't uh, then decide on the use of that power. So we must respect the court's views on this, and it's inappropriate that, that uh, ministers wander in here and simply quote that previous people have said that this doesn't need to happen and therefore it's right, because it's not right, it's wrong and it's unlawful. Thank you. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> well, here we go again, Groundhog Day once again. We've been here before, and those opposite are using the valuable time of this chamber to make their political points again. Minister Reynolds has made a claim for public interest immunity in respect of the deliberations of Cabinet and the disclosure of legal advice in relation to the Centrelink Income Compliance Program. As has been said in this chamber, every time this topic has raised its head, and despite what those on the other side might say, it has been a long-standing practice of successive Australian governments of both political persuasions not to disclose the fact or content of privileged legal advice. We have heard previously, even today, that Labor Minister Senator Joe Ludwig told Senate estimates in 2011 that he would refuse to provide the Labor government's legal advice for the same exact reason. And as we also heard earlier, it was confirmed by another Labor luminary, the Honourable Gareth Evans QC in 1995. Furthermore, we all know that successive governments have upheld that deliberations of Cabinet and its committees should be conducted in secrecy. This ensures the freedoms of Cabinet deliber deliberations can be preserved as it is not in the public interest to disclose those deliberations. I reiterate, this is a long established basis for a public interest immunity claim. As the Minister stated in the order for production letter, even though the class action has resolved and as recognised by the Federal Court on the 11th of June 2021, not all potential claims arising out of the income compliance program will be resolved through the class action. This is because a significant number of class members opted out of the class action and are free to bring their own individual claim should they wish to. As everybody in this chamber knows, the Income Compliance Program has been subject to extensive scrutiny already. This includes from the Common Commonwealth Ombudsman and within parliamentary inquiries, including through the Community Affairs References Committee. The process has also been subject to decisions of the Federal Court. 
As you are aware, the Community Affairs References Committee recently tabled its fourth interim report and has already held nine public hearings on it. And in fact, this committee will be holding another, the 10th hearing, later this week. As announced in November 2019, the agency no longer raises debts by averaging ATO income information without other information on the basis that it is not sufficient. This relates to the sufficiency or adequacy of information used in making an administrative decision, specifically whether or not there is enough information to make that decision. The government respects the decision of the court, including the finding of His Honour Justice Murphy that the settlement agreement proposed was fair and reasonable and has approved the settlement. Yeah. Group members who objected to the settlement will be given a further opportunity to opt out of the class action by the 17th of September 2021. Information about the opt-out process has been sent to objecting group members from the 26th of July this year, and once this process is complete, further information will be sent to class action group members on whether they are eligible for a settlement payment. And I note that there is a web portal and telephone line that will be established so class action members can review their information, raise a query or a dispute. Importantly, in the class action settlement agreement, both Gordon Legal and the Commonwealth acknowledge that the settlement is not an admission of liability by the Commonwealth and it does not reflect any acceptance by the Commonwealth of the allegations that the Commonwealth or any of its officers had any knowledge of the unlawfulness associated with the Income Compliance Program. The Federal Court similarly found that there is little in the materials placed before the Court that could have sustained such an allegation. Once it became clear the basis upon which the debts were being raised through the sole use of average ATO income data was insufficient, Services Australia paused in scope debts as they were identified. As at the 20th of August this year, about $736.6 million has been refunded, which is about 98.1 per cent of the estimated total of $751 million. Around 423,000 people have had their debts refunded and or reduced to zero. Everyone who has responded has either been refunded or is in the process of being refunded. In cases where people haven't responded, their eligibility for a refund will remain on their record. But Services Australia are unable to pay them until they provide up-to-date details so the transaction can be processed. The government is focused on ensuring that the settlement agreement is implemented. Madam Deputy President, the continued rhetoric from the opposition and crossbench that the government is not assisting those who need assistance is a falsehood. It is typical of their political gains that they have so frequently been used to scare the most vulnerable in our community. Frankly, it's no different to Medi-Scare. Within the social service space, the Morrison government is focused on supporting all Australians as the economy recovers from the coronavirus pandemic. From the 1st of April this year, Working age payment rates, including job seeker payment, were increased by $50 and the income free threshold increased to $150 a fortnight. This was done to support job seekers as they secure employment and re-enter the workforce. This reform has been the single biggest year on year increase to the rate of unemployment benefits since 1986 and represents an increase of 9.7% between the 1st of April 2020 and 21. While the opposition has claimed otherwise, the truth is that our social security system has served Australians very well. Prior to the global COVID-19 crisis, we saw the proportion of working age Australians who were reliant on welfare payments drop to 13.5%. Just 13.5%, the lowest level recorded in more than 30 years. No government has done more for Australians doing it tough than the Morrison government. Throughout the height of the pandemic, we provided $32 billion in emergency support payments. This was on top of the previously mentioned increases in welfare payments. The Morrison government's key focus is creating jobs and getting people back into work. We know that getting a job is the best way to improve the living standards of people and their families. And it's not just about the money, it's about self-respect too. Providing for your family promotes self-respect. The continued conduct of the opposition and crossbench is frankly appalling. Finally, Madam Deputy, oh, Mr President, I would like the Senate to note that as outlined in our dissenting comments to the interim report, during the interlocutory hearings in the class action, the Australian Federal Court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relations to documents such as cabinet materials. 
This includes the executive minute to the Minister for Social Services dated the 12th of February 2015. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I, I rise to uh, respond to this gross failure to actually tell the truth, to come clean and give the Australians who were inflicted upon with robo-debt access to the information that they need about what the government knew, how they organised this terrible, terrible experience of public policy that has seen the government have to pay back its own citizens $1.8 billion because they charged you through robo-debt illegally. They sent you a bill you should never have received, and if you didn't cough up without question, they chased you. They chased you and chased you. Well, I, can, I don't care what names the people on the other side of this chamber call me, because I'm going to keep coming in here and raising this on behalf of the hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians who had a debt inflicted on them by their own government. We have the minister claiming that hundreds of questions were answered by public servants. This government's claimed public interest immunity in those hearings over and over and over and said it is against the public interest for them to know the truth about how Mr Morrison cooked up this scheme, how he oversaw it with Minister Robert, with Minister Tudge and now with Minister Reynolds, continuing to try to hide from the Australians what they did, how they decided to make this historic mistake and they refused to continue they refused to provide it now it's just not good enough going forward this has got to be fixed we've got senator reynolds coming in and saying oh on this case in this occasion no the government didn't give any response when it was a labor government you didn't give a response well let me just give you you know a few back 2007 the minister of immigration kevin andrews Minister for Immigration and Citizenship he released advice in relation to the power to cancel the visa of Dr Hanif so before you try to convince people you don't have to fess up, that you don't have to get these documents because that's never been done, let's tell the truth here for a change, shall we? Of course governments hand it over if they have any integrity, and that's what Minister Andrews did. In 2011, Prime Minister Julia Gillard advised the House of Representatives that she had made available to the Leader of the Opposition, who was then Minister, Mr Abbott, the advice of the Solicitor General on asylum seekers and offshore processing. So yes, legal advice is handed over, and even Christian Porter handed over information about the eligibility of Mr Dutton. So this claim that no documents about legal information get handed over, that's got to be put to bed once and for all. And I've got a feeling we're going to be back here debating because I can tell you I will not let this rest. I will not leave all those people who are attacked by their own government, hanging in the wind with its litany of lies that the government comes forward and they start talking all the gobbledygook legal, privilege, pre, uh, legal professional privilege, public immunist, immunity claims, as if they could snow the Australian people with this professional language. But the Australian people are on to this government, especially those who are impacted by robo-debt. They know what was really said so clearly by one of our witnesses last week, who described what the Australian government had done to its own people as a shakedown. That's how they described what happened to them. We've heard from amazing witnesses who told us that this problem is actually continuing. We had a Miss Eagle come and speak to the committee. She, sp she spoke about the problem that happened with robo-debt continuing today. And that's why it's so important that we get these documents. And the government cannot continue to hide behind the smokescreen that it's against the public interest to tell us how you got this so wrong. The public deserve to know. You should be coughing up these documents. You should not be able to do again to the Australian public what you did then. Ms Eagle says this is how it rolls at the moment. A client receives a call from a private number, perhaps on a Saturday, and they're told that they need to make an arrangement to repay a Centrelink debt. The first contact they've had, they ask what the debt is about. They're told to look it up on MyGov or at the app. The client checks. There's no letter there that explains how the debt arose. And it goes on and on and on. The litany of failures, the abuse of artificial intelligence against human rights being perpetrated by this government on its own citizen continues. 
And that is why the mistake of robo-debt has not yet been acknowledged by this government. Despite the fact they paid $1.8 billion back, they still need to come in here and cough up Order. the documents. Senator O'Neill. The question is the motion to take note of the statement be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We now go to motions to take note of answers. Senator Pratt. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham, Colbeck, Reynolds to the questions asked by Senators McAllister, Keneally, O'Neill and myself. Well, what a question time. We have a Prime Minister who has this week called Western Australia cave people, the gall of our Prime Minister who wants to drag WA into the COVID mess of New South Wales and then to Order. call Western Australians Order. cave people. That's right, cave people. Oh, it's an analogy, they said. Oh, well, yes, it is an analogy. It's an analogy for a lack of evolution and living in a cave. It's time this Prime Minister remembered that he governs for the entire country and not just for New South Wales. The people of WA don't believe we have a Prime Minister that governs for Western Australia. This Prime Minister wants to differentiate himself as a champion for freedom in these difficult political times that he has, no doubt, very clearly created for himself. Well, there is no freedom when you live in fear of COVID, in shortages of hospital beds, in fear of getting sick and in fear of bringing disease home to your family. This bloke's got no idea. We've had from, what we've had from him for the last three months, three years, is nothing but blame shifting over and over again. Blaming Western Australia because we won't open up. Blaming states, states for leaks from quarantine. Quarantine that he, this government, is constitutionally responsible for. The Doherty Institute says 80 per cent means we can open up. Well, I'm sorry, but that is not what the Doherty Institute modelling says. He's gone on and blamed the states for vaccine rollout when states had no supply. The Premier said so yesterday. And besides, our Prime Minister said it's not a race anyway. And now our Prime Minister has the gall to whack Western Australians and tell us to get out of our cave. Well, we know that Scott Morrison hasn't supported lockdowns in Western Australia. We know he, tr he tried to gang up with Clive Palmer to tear down our border restrictions. This Prime Minister may not like it. This government may not like it. You may choose to sneer at Western Australia, but Western Australia's COVID strategy has worked. We don't want to be like New South Wales. We have a truckload of freedom right now in Western Australia, a lot more freedom than other parts of the country. Short, sharp lockdowns have worked for us. Locking COVID out of the state has worked for us. Keeping the state working hard with exports has worked for us, and it certainly worked for the country. We are the freest in the country, perhaps the freest in the world. Australia is a lot bigger than New South Wales, and it's time that Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, realised that. Western Australia is a very different place. We don't have spread of coronavirus. We are the most successful economy and community in Australia, and we are providing the export revenue and tax revenue that is supporting the rest of the country. So Western Australia is right to continue to be cautious. The national plan does allow WA to keep COVID out, including by managing the border. And Mark McGowan insisted on this. Order. Mark McGowan insisted on this when the plan was agreed. The real issue isn't what's happening in Western Australia right now or in what's happening in Western Australia in a few months' time. The real issue is what's happening in New South Wales and this Prime Minister trying to deflect attention from his, the messes of his own making. We know we will need to remain uh, vigilant in relation to COVID. Areas right around the world reliant on mining 
have been taken down by COVID and lost production, whereas Western Australia has not. It might surprise our Prime Minister to know that WA Industries staying open is the only reason the government can afford to offer financial assistance to other states that need us. Right now, WA is one of the safest places, if not the safest place in the world, and if that's a cave, I'm going to stick in it. Senator O'Sullivan. Well, there you go. That was, a, that was, a, that was a, an effort. Let's just put it that way. That, that's about as much as I could order. I could give. It was an effort. Order. Was... Senator Watt. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, in, in that uh, five minutes uh, of ranting from the other side, uh, thankfully, another, uh, uh, what was it, five times, help me out here, five times 200, uh, that's two, oh, five times two that's about a th thousand yeah. extra people yeah. went and got vaccinated just in this last five minutes. And now that's despite the, the, the efforts of those on the other side that just want to run down the program that is seeing Australians getting protected from the coronavirus. And thank goodness that Australians are stepping up and doing that in spite of the rubbish that comes from those opposite. It's absolutely outrageous. Now, it is true. Western Australia, frankly, uh, living here or, or spending this three weeks or so here in Canberra, I just can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home back to Western Australia because it is the best place in the world to live and you really wouldn't want to be anywhere else. It's absolutely fantastic. And the way that West Australians have stepped up to deal with the coronavirus pandemic is phenomenal. Is phenomenal. But let's just, let's just deal with some facts and some reality here. The last Delta case that we had come across the border into Western Australia occurred when a, a woman uh, came from Bondi over to Perth. She worked as a, as a health instructor, as a um, physio or something like that in a, in a gym. And uh, it, it spread to uh, just a couple of people that, that she was in close contact with. And those people were isolated. Those people were appropriately isolated uh, and they uh, uh, tested positive. Uh, and then as cases emerged out of those few people that were isolated away due to being in those, uh, in those uh, COVID hotspots, uh, it was at that point, 48 hours after the index case was known, that uh, the state government appropriately locked down because we just didn't know how much, uh, how far the spread had occurred across, uh, across Perth and across the metropolitan area. But as it turned out, there was no further transmission no further transmission apart from those that were in those initial close contact areas. Now, thank goodness for that, because it meant that we didn't have to have an enduring lockdown like what we're seeing here in the ACT and certainly what they're seeing in New South Wales. Now, you contrast that to what's happened here in the ACT. In the ACT, uh, the, the, uh, the Chief Minister uh, immediately locked it down. We all recall the press conference that was held at about 12.15. Uh, in the afternoon, and then by 5 p.m. that day, it was already locked down. Now, this was about uh, you know two days earlier than what uh, the state premier of Western Australia locked down. Western Australia, in the last outbreak occurred. So this notion that he crushed and killed the virus is an absolute outrage. I mean, it's just it's just it's just it's just what you're seeing here in the ACT is is a situation where the, the virus is spreading. Uh, and, and there's a, a huge amount of compliance uh, across. You know, ACT people are very compliant people, uh, and there is a huge effort being taken by the authorities and by the health professionals to ensure that this uh, virus doesn't spread. Now, I drove home from here the other night. Uh, I hired a car to be able to get uh, to and from my apartment because I was here all last week. And I drove home, and I've got New South Wales number plates on my uh, on my hire car, and I was pulled over by the police. And the police asked me, where have you been and where have you going? I uh, obviously uh, complied and told them exactly what I'd been doing. I'd been at work and I was going straight home, as, as per what we're allowed to do. Now, they're taking it very seriously here, very, very seriously. But there's still an element of, of COVID spread. So for Senator Pratt to, to come in here and sort of pretend like there's this 
you know, miraculous thing that's going on in WA just because you know, we're West Australian. I, I, look, I sympathise with that. We are a very special type of people over there. Very that's, that's very true. But I tell you, I mean, it's just outrageous to think that we're somehow immune from this. Now, Western Australia is just as prone to having an outbreak as anywhere else. That we have hundreds of trucks crumbling across the border. And the question is, are we actually ready? Are we actually ready? Is our health system ready? I mean, the, the, uh, the Deputy Premier, the Health Minister over there, blamed Western Australians for the rise in health issues when he said that they weren't presenting because of the COVID issues last year. I mean, it's just outrageous. We're going to make sure that we're actually ready for when there's an outbreak. The best thing Western Australians can do is go and get themselves vaccinated. But we've got to also make sure that the health system is set up and ready. And I'm concerned, Mr President, whether or not Western Australia is actually ready and the health Order. system is Senator ready to take on Senator board. O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I rise today to take note of the as usual and sadly, utterly inadequate answers from those opposite to questions of vaccine for children. This is such an important issue. As with every single other aspect of the vaccine rollout, the Morrison-Joyce government has botched the landing on this. They've missed every deadline, they've missed every goalpost that they set themselves, and Australians are paying the price. Yet their failure is even more egregious when we consider the at-risk communities that they have not only failed, but long ignored. The Disability Royal Commission heard evidence last year that there was a glaring lack of pandemic planning for children and young people with disability. Yet nothing, nothing has been done to effectively prepare for this new stage of the rollout. I read in an ABC article from yesterday that Bodhi, a young man with neuropathy, was forced to make eight separate attempts to get vaccinated in Sydney. And his mother rightly asked, I understand we're in an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented pandemic, but does it really have to be this hard? Yet, in her response to my question today, Minister Reynolds just denied that mothers lived reality. She was dismissed out of hand by the minister. And it just reveals his failure to actually deal with the, cr the, the crushing reality of parents just trying to get access to a vaccine for a disabled child. It really didn't have to be this hard, I say to Bodhi's mum, but it is because of the ineptitude of this government. Bodhi's condition means that he's difficulty managing his lungs and were he to get COVID, he would have much greater difficulty breathing than if you or I got COVID. And tragically, his older brother had a similar condition and that poor family is suffering the grief of losing uh, that other brother who died of pneumonia three years ago. We've got to make access to vaccines for kids with disability as easy as possible. And it hasn't been on the to-do list for, Mr. Morrison, for Minister Morrison and Minister Reynolds. In the US, they've managed to get around 600,000 vaccinations out the door for children aged 12 to 15, and more than 15, 4 million of those under 17 have got the vaccination. Yet, Scott Morrison's ruled out including children in our vaccine targets before opening up. Now, we all want to open up. We all want to be with our families. We all want some sense of normal. We all want businesses to get back up and running if they can. We want to get back to work. But no one, no one in those groups wants to trigger an attack on our children of this illness deaths of children because this hasn't been properly planned for. Modelling by epidemiologists from ANU have warned that excluding children from our vaccination targets could result in thousands more deaths across this community with those children who are most vulnerable caught up with Delta because it's highly transmissible with children. This is going to be particularly worrying for populations also that are disproportionately young, like Aboriginal populations in Western New South Wales. And I'm advised that Dubbo, um, in Dubbo, the ABC News Central West has reported that only 6.3 per cent of Aboriginal people in Western New South Wales are vaccinated at this stage. And there's a massive outbreak about which I made a contribution just before question time. Now, this government's appalling mismanagement of the rollout has left Indigenous communities without the recommended Pfizer vaccine. And remember, Mr Morrison was offered, offered 40 million doses by Pfizer in June 2020. 
He squibbed it. He didn't get those vaccines. And because he made that choice, this is where we are, without adequate Pfizer. People on lists waiting, desperate for it, who can't get it. And it all comes back to the Prime Minister's decision to reject those Pfizer, those 40 um, million Pfizer vaccines. With only 8 per cent of the First Nations population fully vaccinated across the country, words fail me. I cannot think of what's going to happen in the remote communities that will be inflicted with the Delta strain very, very soon. Chronically underserviced by successive Liberal and national governments, particularly in New South Wales, those communities have been forced to stay away from members of their community lest they contract this deadly disease and have to leave country for indefinite periods. But that is what's happening right now in the central west of New South Wales. This government is failing the people of Australia. Order. Senator O'Neill. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. So let's just start with a fact, shall we? And for those opposite, a fact is something based in truth. So when we talk about vaccinating children and suggesting that we should be looking at children under 12, there is actually not a vaccine approved for them globally. So let's just stop with that little piece of fallacy, shall we? But I'm, you know, perhaps you want those of us with children under 12 to offer them up as guinea pigs, but uh, I can assure you that won't be happening. But I do note, as the parent of a 12-year-old boy who is an NDIS participant, I'm thrilled that my beautiful boy is now eligible from today to get the vac Pfizer vaccine. But what I also know, we were able to get an appointment, had I been in Sydney, tomorrow morning, 7.30am at the hospital that is less than 250 metres from my apartment. 250 metres from my apartment at 7.30 tomorrow morning, I could have got him his first Pfizer jab. And there were multiple other options available across New South Wales. So, unfortunately, I'm not in Sydney. I'm not there to be able to take it up. But had I been there, we would have been able to get our first dose tomorrow morning of Pfizer for a 12-year-old boy who's an NDIS participant. And I do accept, though, that sometimes families can struggle to find this information to figure out where they can get a booking because they are available in health hubs, in pharmacies, through GPs. So for those opposite that might actually be interested in assisting people, perhaps you'd like to direct them to my website, hollyhughes.com.au. My staff have put together a fantastic COVID page, collating all the information from federal, state and private sites, letting people know where they can book a vaccine, what vaccines are available and how long it'll take for them to get in. But also on top of that, as of yesterday, in recognition of all participants, the NDIS over 12 now being eligible for a vaccine, Tom in my office really went over and above. He's put together a page specifically for people with a disability. So not only have we included information on where people can go and get a vaccine, we've actually put information in there containing social stories. Because we understand for a lot of people with a disability, doing something new, something a bit scary, something that you don't really understand can be challenging. So we've included links to social stories. And for those of you that don't understand what that is, they're very simple stories with language and pictures that help families and carers explain to the person with a disability what's going to happen, what does it mean, how they might have to weigh what they're going to have to do when they get to their appointment. And this is because some of us actually understand the challenges of having a child with a disability and what that means when coming to get a vaccine. So we've gone out of our way, or in fact, not even out of our way, just done what we do to include information to assist these families. But I would like to also acknowledge David in my office. He got a couple of phone calls last week from parents of children with disabilities who were struggling to find where to get a vaccine. So for one family in particular, one, he pointed them in the right direction on our website and they managed to find one themselves. But for another one that was still struggling, he went out of his way. He made the phone calls for them. And that child received their very first vote dose of vaccine this week because I saw the letter yesterday from that parent thanking him 
for the assistance and going over and above what was required. So perhaps for Senator O'Neill, next time she gets a phone call from someone like Bodie's mum, perhaps rather than using Bodie as, a, as an opportunity to score a political point, perhaps Senator O'Neill and her office might like to go to some effort to actually assist the family, to actually work with them through this issue, not use it as a political point scoring exercise. It is absolutely disgraceful. So to you opposite, to all of those opposite sitting there, casting those stones, throwing those barbs, but not really ever helping anybody, let me give you some advice. Perhaps you'd like to find some real information. Perhaps make it available to your constituents. Perhaps ensure that people know where to go when they find information rather than running a fearmonger and scare campaigns. But rather than parents with disability offending us and patronising, maybe try and help us. Order, Senator Hughes. Now, at 4pm, in about 15 seconds, we are interrupting debate to go to the disallowance. So I was going to return to take note after that. Um, rather than interrupt someone 15 seconds into a speech. So at being 4pm, we'll go to the motion...